ready for this? It doesn't have to be this way. We could use... Welcome to the year 2045, where the world witnesses an increased number of natural and man-made disasters, and more people are at risk of losing their lives and livelihoods. Are you ready for this? It doesn't have to be this way. We could use the futures to create a better world. Futures thinking on disaster risk reduction and resilience aims to shed light on the future world that we want to live in by encouraging young professionals in the Asia Pacific to rethink DRR and resilience. Young professionals are challenged to tap into the power of imagination to alter any biases and assumptions about the futures. We provide a platform of discussion for young professionals on DRR issues through webinars, future literacy labs, and let's talk DRR sessions. Our webinar will take stock of the evolution of DRR to build a more solid foundation for the futures of DRR. Our futures literacy labs will bring the region's top young professionals to join in our interactive sessions on DRR by exploring and challenging various scenarios for the futures. We then share the results with the wider audience and experts during our Let's Talk DRR session. Our key findings will be published in 2022 at the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction. Follow us to find out the world we could live in. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to the Let's Talk DLL1 on the futures of disaster risk governance in 2045. My name is Sachi Suzuki from UNESCO Jakarta office. This Let's Talk DLL is a part of the futures thinking on disaster risk reduction activity under the collaboration of UNESCO Regional Science Bureau for Asia and the Pacific in Jakarta and UNDLL Regional Office for the Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. UNDP Indonesia Accelerator Love and You Inspire Alliance. So it is a follow up to our first Futures Literacy Laboratory on Disaster Risk Reduction that was held virtually from 14th to 16th July 2021. And we are pleased to let you know that we have 10 young professionals from Asia with us today who will share their collective thoughts on the futures of disaster risk governance in 2045. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Christine Kavazansian from the Futures Literacy Team, Social and Human Sciences, UNESCO, and Ms. Lati Krishnan, Strategy and Foresight Advisor for UNDP, and Mr. Omal Amak, External Relations Officer from UNDLL. Please monitor the announcement in the Zoom and the Facebook live chat on how to ask questions, uh, to fill in the attendance form and other information related to these uh, uh, speakers and uh, topics. Without further ado, let's start with the first session on the introduction to the Futures Literacy Laboratory on Disaster Risk Reduction. I would like to invite Ms. Christine to turn on her video. Ms. Christine. Good. Um, I would like to briefly um, introduce her. Ms. Christine is a Futures Literacy Practitioner and Designer at UNESCO. She holds a degree in Diaspora and Transitional Studies and MBA from the University of Oxford. Christine spent a large part of her professional career in the banking sector with a focus on business strategy and change management. She also worked with the uh, Inclusive Policy Lab at UNESCO, which focuses on the uh, emerging issues of knowledge production and its transition into inclusive and equity-weighted policies. On the Futures Literacy team, Christine works closely with the Global Futures Literacy Network and was responsible for the planning of the 2020 Futures Literacy Summit and is a designer 
and the facilitator for the future solutions laboratories. Okay, so um, I'd like to get into the discussion and conversation with Christine. Um, first, um, could you let us know briefly uh, what futures literacy is and what drove you to work in the field of this uh, futures literacy? Over to you. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you for the nice introduction and uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be a part of this. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let's start with, you know, what is futures literacy? Uh, well, futures literacy uh, is a skill. So it's a skill that allows us to better understand the role the future has today in the present. So how do we perceive, how do we perceive uh, and how might we act based on these perceptions? Um, so we often make the comparison to traditional literacy like reading and writing uh, or financial or media literacy. Um, what these literacies all kind of have in common is that they represent capabilities around understanding and effectively using different skills for different reasons. Um, they're also, of course, capabilities that can be learned and improved uh, over time. So in the context of futures literacy specifically, uh, we look at how and why we anticipate. So are we anticipating to plan and to prepare for the future? Uh, so for example, I, I, I'm going to school and I'm going to school because I've set the objective of getting a job. Um, this is what you know, we refer to as anticipation for the future. Or on the other hand, are we anticipating for something that uh, doesn't yet exist. So, uh, you know, for example, I, I know I want to learn, uh, but I'm actually open to where and how this might, how this learning might take place. Um, so this is kind of what we refer to as anticipation for emergence. And in futures literacy, both are important because of course we have to plan, we have to prepare, uh, but at the same time, we have to learn to be open enough not to let those plans kind of constrain us. Um, and so if, we're able, if we start to be able to do this, uh, we can start to maybe enhance kind of the way and the things that we start to perceive uh, in the present. So for example, you know, what do we notice? What do we pay attention to when we're making these strategic decisions for tomorrow? Um, are we are we just extrapolating what we already know from the past and kind of projecting it into the future? Um, or are we, are we able to kind of take note of the past, but also use our imagination and use our creativity to start thinking outside of the box uh, when, we, when we start to, um, when, we, when we're thinking about the future. So the idea with futures literacy is, we're not, uh, we're not trying to build certainty into the future because that's kind of impossible. Uh, we, what, we're, what we are doing is that uh, we're kind of developing this ability to actually become more comfortable with the uncertainty of the future, open to uh, new ideas and, and you know, new ways of doing things. Um, and this is really applicable to, to so many areas like building resilient communities, uh, to policy making, to uh, strategic planning, and just generally, you know, how we deal, deal, with, um, deal with risk and, and uncertainty because uh, it's, all, it's really all around us. So um, just quickly, you might, you might be wondering, you know, how does all of this, uh, you know, work practically? Um, and we're gonna obviously spend today talking about Futures Literacy Labs, but um, Futures Literacy Labs are really uh, kind of the tool that we use uh, to build Futures Literacy as a capacity. So it's, you know, very carefully designed process and we integrate these two paradigms I was talking about, the anticipation for the future and anticipation for emergence. And what becomes uh, kind of evident throughout the process is how powerful the future is. Um, you know, when we think about the future, uh, we don't realize sometimes that how it's kind of charged with our emotions, how it's charged with our hopes and our, and our fears. And often um, those fears, they kind of come from the unknown, uh, the unknown of the future. 
Um, and so through the labs, we try to remind everyone that the future is actually unknowable for all of us. We're, we're all in the same boat. And, uh, you know, as much as we might like to predict the future, we can't. Uh, so if we can't predict it, what then can we do? Um, and and what, we, what we try and, and push forward is, is this ability to accept and embrace the uncertainty uh, rather than reject it because, you know, we might fear it, um, become comfortable, you know, with the unfamiliar uh, and try to try to appreciate and make sense of difference uh, rather than look for replication. So, um, like I said earlier, you know, just like it might sound, it might sound challenging, but just like any skill, uh, you know, the more you practice, uh, kind of the better you, you get at it. So I think the labs are kind of really the, the, point of departure for, for a learning journey. And um, your question around, you know, what drives me to work in the field, I think ties really nicely to this idea of, of learning journey. Uh, for me personally, if I'm learning, uh, I'm happy. And, um, and you know, at, at UNESCO, we really try to take this capability-based approach to, to development. Um, so, we see futures literacy not, you know, as an end in itself, but as a means towards this development. Um, and I've I've seen how futures literacy can really impact individuals, can impact communities, uh, give them a sense of empowerment and a sense of agency. Uh, and I, and you know, that part of working in the field is is uh, the most rewarding. So. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much for providing a very comprehensive view on future literacy. And also you mentioned that embracing um, uncertainty. And this sounds like a very um, closely related to the disaster risk reduction. Uh, but could you explain how the future literacy um, can contribute to the disaster risk reduction? And also for the uh, laboratory, I'm very interested in the aspect of um, uh, very practical aspects. So like how was it conducted and then what kind of topic did you discuss? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, the labs are kind of this tool that we use to develop uh, futures literacy as a capability. Um, and so it's, it is this practical component um, and labs are always, uh, a co-designed and co-created process uh, between, you know, future literacy practitioners and what we what we like to call local champions. So in our uh, in our case, the local champions is UNESCO, UNDRR, uh, UNDP Accelerator Labs, UNSPIRE, uh, and all of us work together um, to to develop, design, co-create a lab. Uh, and, and we're actually running a series of labs and, and the one I'll, I'll tell you about is the, the first official one uh, that we ran from the, the 14th to the 16th uh, out of a series of, of three. Um, so, so what we did was we got together and we said, you know, how can we explore priorities, different priorities that are related to disaster risk? There are so many, of course, you know, that we thought about education, we thought about technology, uh, resilience, um, you know, what, what was the best kind of place to start? Um, and what we ended up selecting was the futures of disaster risk governance in 2045. Uh, and, and we chose governance because we thought it was kind of a good place to start to, I guess, peel back the onion and, and look um, underneath to start to think through, you know, the different structures, the processes, the norms uh, that are underlying governance systems, um, and so and so that's that's kind of where we started. And like I said, the 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 lab process is is very much a co-design. So we work with a, the local champion first and foremost to. Uh, ensure that we capture kind of local context. How do we design the lab so that it's relevant to the, the participants, the people who, who will be invited to, to take part and to explore this topic? Um, and then secondly, also to take a, kind of a train the trainer approach. So as we design the lab together, we're also building the, the futures literacy capacity uh, in, in, the, in the core design group. And, and we, we, we asked a, a number of you to actually facilitate yourselves. So um, that was kind of, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the beginning. So um, with, with labs, uh, what, we, what we really try to ensure is kind of creating conditions for uh, collective intelligence. So this is really a, a guiding principle of, uh, of the four phases of, of the lab. And, and I'll tell you just briefly about, about those four phases, but the, the importance of collective intelligence is, is uh, to allow participants to kind of arrive, uh, feel that they can share uh, different perspectives um, and, and explore these ideas together. Uh, so we as a core group, we, we met on a regular basis leading up to the lab itself. And we went through you know, a number of details like timing, even music, uh, you know, what games, what tools can we use to help participants think a little bit differently about the future, to, to kind of play with the future, to use the future as, as it was mentioned in, in that introductory video. So, um, you know, overall it was, it was a really a collective effort. Um, and, and so let me just really briefly dive into kind of the, the four different phases of, of the lab. So um, as I mentioned, all, all the, the labs are, are very kind of tailored, but there, are, there will always be these, these uh, kind of scaffolds, I guess, uh, for, for shaping the lab. So what we do in phase one uh, is we've, we call phase one reveal. So here it's kind of like a, like a practical way of using the future. We ask participants to think of, uh, you know, pr preferable and probable. Uh, futures of disaster risk governance. So what are you betting on? What are you, what do you predict might happen? Uh, and what do you hope for? So this is where participants uh, start to reveal their anticipatory assumptions about the topic at hand. Um, and so in this, in this phase, uh, for our lab in specific, we used a tool uh, developed by Suhail and Ayatullah. It was called the Futures Triangle. So, you know, I mentioned we, as facilitators, we try to kind of guide the process of thinking about the future differently. And, and the triangle looks at the weight of the past, the push of the present, and the pull of the future when trying to imagine, you know, these different images uh, when it comes to, to probable and preferable. So phase two is, um, is what we call the reframe. So here we really move away from those predictions and, and the desires. And we, we actually provide participants with something that's quite unfamiliar. Um, and we, we call this the ref, a reframed future, a reframed scenario that is specific to the topic. So each lab will have a different uh, we'll have a different reframe. So for our lab, we, we designed something called the Murmuration Intensive Society. Um, and what we wanted to do is kind of play on different notions of leadership, different notions of governance. Uh, and what we did was we, in our, in our, in our future, we emphasized experimentation. We emphasized that uh, the society is actually not hierarchical, it's heterarchical. And then we asked participants, so this is kind of the, you know, drawing on anticipation for emergence. So we then asked participants, what does this society actually look like? You know, you're there. So describe it for us. Um, and this is, this phase is just about getting participants to engage with their imagination, to kind of let go of what they know uh, and to play and to collectively kind of develop uh, new new futures from an uncertain, from an unfamiliar, uh, from a, maybe a complex uh, point of departure. Um, so so that's phase two. Uh, phase three is called new questions. Uh, new questions is really about a point of reflection. So we're looking back at phase one and two. Uh, we're thinking about you know what are we're comparing uh, you know the different images that came through in in those phases, and we're asking are asking ourselves, what, what do we notice that might be different? What might we have, you know, taken for granted? Um, and, you know, now having gone through that reflection, do we rethink, do we look at the topic at hand? So in this case, governance, do we think, think about it a little bit differently? And we, we ask participants, you know, what new questions uh, do you have? And then finally, uh, that leads us to phase four. Uh, and so phase four is all about next steps. 
Um, this can vary from lab to lab. It doesn't always look the same. And what we try and do is kind of take the, the uh, desired objectives of the local champion. Um, and so here, uh, again, drawing from the, the co-design uh, element, we drew from the experience of one of our facilitators who was a teacher um, and who used to kind of start her classes with a set of questions, you know, identify what you know and what you want to know, and then ended uh, the, the, the session with um, what did you learn, uh, what do you still want to know, and how might you act now that you've gone through the lab, and so that's what we, we ended up using for, for, our, uh, for our phase four in this lab. Thank you so much for a very solo explanation on the steps. It's very interesting to learn that it's very highly collaborative and participatory. And also um, the steps are carefully designed to really release the imagination of the participants. Um, before hearing from um, participants of this future literacy laboratory, I would like to ask as an expert of future literacy laboratory and also you, you participated in the first uh, features of literacy laboratory on disaster risk reduction. What was your impression of the, this experience? Thanks for this question. So I think, um, I think there are many ways to evaluate a lab. Uh, so from, from what I look for is uh, just a few criteria. So one, uh, have we learned something new? Uh, two, you know, have we had the chance to rethink the topic uh, from a new or different perspective? Um, have we, of course, met the objectives of the local champion? And then, of course, you know, did we enjoy the process? Um, so, you know, for, for all of these kind of criteria, I think it's an absolute resounding yes. So, you know, my overall impressions and experience of the lab was um, super rich, uh, very fruitful, um, and, and really because I think all of the participants uh, were able to rethink this topic. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that we get to do on a daily basis to kind of disrupt, uh, you know, our way of thinking, disrupt the status quo. And um, I think when I, when I look back at uh, what, I, what I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the questions we asked before, what, what do you want to know? What do you, what can you identify as what you know? And I compare that to the phase four, which was, you know, what did you learn? How will you act? Um, you know, what will you take away? I think that for me really highlighted the kind of learning journey. Because when I look at the, the, the comments in the first phase, it was a lot of search for answers. It was, you know, what will be the markers of progress for disaster risk reduction? What, um, what is the future? Who will be making decisions? So it was kind of like reflecting our, our human nature and kind of desire to want to know the future. And then when I look at phase four uh, and kind of what, we, what, what the participants were saying, I, I saw still this sense of curiosity, but kind of even more heightened. Um, you know, uh, participants were talking about how can we rethink the role of youth? How can we include an intergenerational approach to government? Um, how can we build a community of practice uh, amongst each other uh, and, and integrate learnings from each other into our daily work? So um, all of those things make it you know, a very uh, fruitful lab for, for me personally. Um, and, and then I think finally, we also we also integrated reflections. You know, it can be an intense process, and um, sometimes it takes you know a few hours or a few days to absorb the, those learnings. And when I read those reflections, uh, you know, I really uh, picked up on the sense of empowerment, the sense of agency that participants took away to say that you know I as an individual uh, can feel that I can make a difference. Uh, I feel that I can have an impact on, on the policies uh, that are made uh, and on, on the future. So I think uh, for me, that was uh, incredibly rewarding and I am looking forward to the next ones coming up in the, in the series. Thank you very much. Um, after hearing uh, your view, um, I'm very excited to hear from the participants 
the youth and young professionals who actually participated in the laboratory. So thank you very much, Ms. Christine, and also all the support from uh, UNESCO uh, Futures Literacy Team. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. So um, just for announcement uh, for the audience, if you are interested in the laboratory activity, we post some information on the chat for your reference. Now, allow me to hand over to the moderation, um, Ms. Nurul Lathatingyas from You Inspire Alliance for the next session. Thank you. Saki, um, my name is Nurul Lathatingyas and I will be the moderating for this session. Before that, I would uh, remind all of you, if you have uh, questions, of the team presentation, please post in the, in the chat box and the presenting team will answer the questions in the Q&A box. We have five teams in the future literacy laboratory and on disaster risk reductions. Each team consists of five to six young professionals with gender, region, age, and professional background balance. In this session, representatives of the team will share their collective thoughts and future scenario of disaster risk governance in 2045. I will let each team to introduce their team members, and each team will only have up to 10 minutes to share the result, output, conclusions of the team future disaster risk governance. Without further ado, let us travel to 2045 to know disaster risk governance in that year. I would like to invite the first team, which is the right team. We have Mr. Howder and Ms. Garima. Hi, uh, good afternoon all. Halda, I request you to share the screen. Hi, I'm Garima. I'm a young professional from India. I'll be sharing the collective thoughts of FLL team, Red Team. As you are now uh, introduced to future literacy, please allow me to take you along and travel to 2045. It's more than two decades away. How do you imagine it? World might be upset, upside down. Are you ready for the future? In my presentation, I'll be briefly talking about the probable future and the future we want. So as you all know that uh, change is law of nature and our future might be different from the times we are living in. So we divided the probable future into two different aspects. So first would be the positive changes that we think that would be occurring in the times to come in 2045. So we expect that in 2045, there would be more interagency collaboration of TRR at local level, at national level, at international level. There would be more investment in mitigation and adaptation. Our societies would be more uh, advanced. It would have more know-how on, on technology and it will have more sense into disaster, there would be higher preparedness We have technical issues from Karima. Am I audible? Yes, now. Welcome yes. back. Let's proceed. So I was sharing about uh, the negative changes that might occur uh, in uh, 2045. Uh, these would be negative because of the sense that uh, these changes would affect the advancements that we have had in the field of TRR and uh, disaster risk governance, like uh, we already know that there is climate change and the uh, extreme climate would affect 
uh, the disasters and there would be more frequent as well as more severe. So we also expect that we would be having uh, less adaptive solutions because climate is going to have a lot of changes that we cannot control. The human race would not be able to actually control the changes and hence adaptation would also take time. Apart from that, we uh, also thought that public health and technological disasters would have more adverse effects. As we already see, the cor coronavirus is affecting our world and it's a public health emergency. So uh, there can be more uh, pathogens release and more viruses which can affect our, um, which can affect our diaspora and it will also affect the developments that we had in the uh, DRR scenario. So in the next part, in the uh, in the next part of the same slide, as you see, there's a triangle. This is future triangle. Uh, this triangle has three different uh, sides. So on the first side of it, as you can see, we are carrying a weight of the past. So from from our past, we would be carrying the burden that uh, not all people in the society would have equal knowledge and equal awareness about the disasters. And then uh, not each society or each part of the world would be capacitated in the way that other parts would be. Then the other side of the angle that you, uh, angle of the triangle that you see, there is pull of the future. We would move towards adaptive governance and adaptive policies to disasters. While there's a push from future, where we would have effective coordination between the actors and various agencies. We would have sharing of information, sharing of resources. Apart from that, there would be environmental security issues as our resources would be depleting our water, our food, our energy, and other natural resources. And hence, this can be a potential trigger for the conflicts that may arise. So that can be a push from the future. I would then uh, like to move on to the next slide, which would cover the future we want. Uh, the future we want is actually very different from the probable future. In probable future, we might not have uh, a risk-free society, but we imagine our society to be risk-free. We imagine that there would be zero disaster, and we want to also avert the impacts of climate change so that we live uh, quite safely and, uh, and our lives and the livelihoods are not affected by the disasters as there would be no disasters. We imagine that there would be higher awareness to promote sustainable practices. And we also wish that there would be a new uh, paradigm in disaster risk reduction, both in governance and management. So we divided the governance and disaster risk management differently, as you can see. So in the governance domain, we will have a better collaboration of stakeholders and responsive governance models. While in disaster risk management, we will, we will have advanced early warning system, advanced dissemination. We will have entrepreneurship from DRR and there would be advanced disaster preparedness levels because in, we want our disaster preparedness to be up to it. So I would, uh, we would go to the next slide. Halda. In 45, in the FLL, we reframe the future of the yeah. Maybe I'll continue. Looks like thank you, Garima. And we are still in 2045 in the FLL. We reframe the future of the uh, DRG with murmuration intensive society. And our group visions and reflection for the MIS is that an autonomous society that have equal power relations and continuous learning, but no apparent leaderships. Uh, this no clear leaderships in the term of the DRG could potentially create conflict among the society. The MIS is beautiful and strong when they are together, but there will be any disagreement among them the society will break into two or more smaller society 
that eventually weaken the society as a whole. And our perception about the future of the DRG related to the MIS is that in the future. Four minutes for the team. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Is distributed equally among uh, society. The society will have continuous experimentation and learning process toward the disaster risk governance. Information is transparent and accessible for all members of society. But we think also it's better that leadership uh, will still be in the hand of the government and the DRR governance will still be dependent on the country leaderships and policy. Last one is natural force leadership will still control the pattern of uh, DRR governance. We also discussed the myth or the proverb that trouble is the beginning of the disasters. If society is not strong enough, if there are so many disagreement, disobedience, this will increase their risk for the disasters. And from three days of the FLL, the first two days we are traveling to the future. In the third day, we back to the present to think about the assumption we made when we frame our future of the DRG. The assumption and question we have is as follows. In order to have strong collaboration between government and society, the governance and policy must be inclusive than today. Also, does the community well trained and aware of the disaster? Society and community will also need to have uh, the same access to the information available and all the data need to be secure and believable. And then the next one is do the stakeholder in the disaster risk governance willing to collaborate does everyone have equal power regarding the governance? And the last thing is, does the ecosystem have support, have support from, for the enablers? And our thought and reflection on the FL on the DRGs, FL I think uh, is how we reimagine the ideal future and then plan backward. Using the FL methodology, we can think that some of the future uh, are predetermined and predictable. We also learn how important to plan the futures with those planning that uh, we can anticipate, make decisions and take actions based on it. The last ones uh, with the future literacy labs, it's enable us to think out of the box to promote the DR and overall sustainability. I'll be taking it forward. Uh, we as individuals should be more sensitive and aware we need to connect and also comprehend on different aspects as well as build network for sharing data as well as experiences so that we can learn and we can also uh, spread the same thing to other people. So on the behalf of Red Team, we would like to wrap it up and thank all of you for being a patient listener. And uh, Thank you. Okay, thank you for the red team. Very uh, inspiring presentations. Uh, let's now we move to the next team. Uh, we have a uh, yellow, yellow team. We have uh, Ms. Sukma and Mr. Risa. Thank you, Shops. If I can have Pak Ardita to share our screen, please. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Nurul and Pak Ardito. So our team consisted of me and Rico from Indonesia and Rashad from Afghanistan, um, Joy from Thailand, Muit from Pakistan, and Nahula from Maldives. So we started the lab, uh, the next slide please. We started the lab by identifying weight of the past. So we came up with so many problems that have been rooted in the disaster risk governance, but we tried to classify them into three main messages um, that we want to bring out, which is collaboration, technology, and inclusivity. So the first weight of the past is that individuality and overlapping work among stakeholders that somehow didn't get the work done. And the second is the problem of resistance to an disproportionately distribution of technological solution. And in this regard, we know that the power and technology constitute each other, but the technology of disaster is often overlooked. So 
that would be the second word of the past. And the third one is we acknowledge the gender inequality and in general, just the lack of meaningful community participation. So those are the setbacks and barriers to change in the disaster risk governance. And then we move to identify the push of the present. We first acknowledge the existing of SDGs, where it pushes uh, the approach of working cross sectors between and within institutions and ensuring harmony from policy through activity. And then we also have the push of the increasing quality education and research in technology of disaster. And for the inclusivity, we know um, the increasing social activism nowadays, especially by young generation, has been um, the catalyst of the social, in, um, social inclusion in the government. So those things existing in today's trends might influence potential futures concerning disaster risk governance. And from those assumptions, we anticipate that the probable future in 2045 will prior prioritize um, multi multilateral collaboration and collective actions between governments and local um, communities. And then the second one is that the future governance will address the, the ever increasing hazards by using advanced technology such as um, AI. And then the third one is we will see more women and youth and children taken into consideration of disaster risk prevention and decision making. And move to the next slide, please. We're talking about desirable futures. Um, we discussed that first in collaboration and working cross sector, we will be seeing a more reliable government, like more political leaders have a political will at DRR and adaptive government that actually led by localized and collaborative efforts. Because if we have all range of different types of agencies and the politics embedded in it, the reliable actors are really needed. And there will also be more professional at emergency management and bottom up uh, approaches. So on technology, we specifically imagine to see um, the advanced technology and its use in supporting DRR, such as the integration of um, indigenous knowledge and the using of AI for emergency response. And moreover, we will see more investment on the World Disasters Data Pool Center and stronger resiliency on infrastructure and people, um, not only on the technology, but also the power relations that comes with it. And then on the inclusive society and system, we can see that disaster risk governance is now, now actually based more on top down rather than bottom up. So we know that they try to keep people engaged by the face barriers. And one of the barriers is because they are part of a deeply hierarchical structure. And so in 2045, our desirable future is that um, local participation communities are actually leading the recovery and the, govern the disaster risk governance. Um, more women and young people become decision makers and person of disabilities are also provided with free and accessible um, assistive equipment as well as access to education and healthcare. And so I will give the floor to Rashad to explain the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sukma. Uh, this is Rashad from Afghanistan and thanks to my uh, teammates that uh, allows me to represent their uh, thoughts here and 
Uh, yeah, the the t three uh, the, the, the third part that uh, which is reframing, I would like to share uh, thoughts of our uh, friends, our uh, teammates. That uh, in addition, that uh, what Sukma already shared with uh, you, uh, as you can see in the presentation left side, there is uh, lots of sticky notes which indicates ideas of. Uh, uh, members of our team and conclusions in the right side uh, based on that uh, three uh, con conclusion categories that uh, Sukma already mentioned, uh, which are as follows. Uh, adaptive disaster risk governance, uh, a system to sustain the idea that is more non-state actors play more rules, merit-based in the state of seniority system, non-exploitative system, and self-governing system must be the uh, prerequisition condition or enabling environment. And the second is uh, uh, our team's, uh, yeah, our team's uh, vision and reflection of the murmuration intensive society that uh, every voice matters in the community, which need to be taken into consideration and affect the community's uh, direction in responding to any challenge, uh, disaster is, yeah, any challenge. Disaster is a game changer that affects uh, the form of a governance that remains centralized, decentralized, or distributed. We argued that uh, decentralized communication could be uh, effective, acknowledging the challenge to adopt it, uh, to adopt it in a deep, centralized government like in Asia Pacific. Nantless society still needs strong actors to mobilize the resources and uh, direct the policies. The, uh, the third one, the key uh, takeaways of the yellow group at the causal layer analysis or related to the inclusive actors where more non-state actors take the lead at uh, disaster risk governance. Then after, yeah. Uh, next slide, uh, uh, Pardito. Yeah, thank you, Pardito. Uh, that, uh, yeah, and after all above the discussion, we came up with uh, some new questions that needs to be answered by authorities, professionals, and scientists, and all as follows. Yeah, the, uh, to, to what extent are collaborative projects being monitored? How do you make sure the stakeholders are supported to reach the local targets? And the second question, to what extent do we invest on technologies that do not exist yet? Uh, what does a meaningful inclusive, inclusivity mean? How do people prioritize? And finally, I want to uh, conclude the yellow team presentation by saying uh, this uh, quote that the key to the future of our disaster risk governance lies in the collaboration, use of technology and on inclusivity. Uh, thanks to your uh, attention. And uh, now uh, over to you in rule, our presentation is over. Thank you. Thank you, Richard and Sukma uh, from the Yellow Team. Uh, very it's a wonderful presentation. Now we move to the next team. We have a blue team here. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Christine and Mr. Daniels. Time is yours. Everyone, can you see my screen? Yes, no, I just kind of present it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, she teach you on it. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Hitit and Daniel from Blue Team. I will be talking about. Uh, our progress in a conversation manner. So here we go. 
Uh, hi, Danielle. We haven't seen each other since the pandemic started. How have you been? Yeah, of course. We haven't been able to travel anywhere. I kind of miss meeting up with people. Well, despite that, I'm doing great. Thanks. How about you? Yeah, I'm also doing good, taking my classes remotely and uh, keeping myself safe at home. It's all online life. And Daniel, uh, when do you think this pandemic will end? Well, I'm keeping my hopes high. I think despite all the access issues, countries are moving fast with vaccination. Yeah, well, I also hope so. Well, Shitich, what do you think life would be after this? Imagine if we are, if we are in 2045, the pandemic is over. What is the first thing you can imagine? Yeah, uh, that would be great. Pandemic would be over. <laughs> And uh, yeah, first imagination would be about myself. I would be 40 years old. And uh, I think I would be uh, somewhere in the Himalayas and uh, I'll be working as a monitoring team and we will monitor the slope deformation uh, in the mountain slopes. And uh, we already know where landslides, uh, debris flow and floods may happen in future. And we also monitor the ground deformations uh, around different valleys uh, in Nepal and in Himalayas, like Kathmandu Valley and Pokhara. That's well, uh, that's lo a lot about <laughs> me. And, and overall, I think in 45, there is a better technology because of uh, better community knowledge and capacity building of uh, young professionals. And uh, there would be technological advancement and artificial intelligence would take the lead. Uh, and more would be evidence-based policy and uh, there would be DRR people are doing good jobs and uh, DRR entrepreneurships. Well, uh, that's a bit positive side, but uh, there, I think there will be uh, more hazards. The frequency of natural hazards will rise because of this climate change issues and also the seismic activities like earthquakes and volcano, they weaken the terrain. So, and uh, there could be other issues like uh, sea level rise and technological hazards. But uh, to conclude, uh, by 2045, there will be more natural hazards. It is predictable, but uh, there will be less disasters with better technology and better understanding. Well, that sounds really hopeful and amazing. You know, both positive and negative vibes. But you know, what kind of future that you desire then? Uh, about desirable, my first reaction would be, normal pandemics and uh, <laughs> that's true <laughs> by 2045 uh, yeah uh, the people are not killed by natural hazards anymore we cannot say that there are, there will be no natural hazards but uh, no disasters all the people are safe and uh, countries are collaborating more and more for disaster risk reduction and there will be open science the science is open to everyone data is open for everyone so people can bring innovation and uh, there are models for disaster risk reduction uh, about hazard prediction that uh, runs on a global scale. So uh, there will be improvements on a global scale as well. And the satellite technology is uh, very precise and it can monitor all the hazards. And uh, finally, I think uh, uh, there is a younger people uh, leading the governments and uh, there is more innovation and there is risk informed decision making also evident best policy making i couldn't agree more i would want to have all those things but now we just need to work for it yes uh but what do you think uh, that will limit us what do you think will stop us from achieving that desirable future well while we feel the current leaders can be quite limiting, what we really need is actually a new form of leadership. I believe in communities that lead themselves to become better leaders. We need a decentralized approach for the future. Um, and what we really need is adaptive leadership, a more agile evidence-based policy, and also activated and interest-based community. And finally, to top that off, we actually need to communicate our science better. To govern better, we need to make both people and the leader understand science. But I agree with you earlier, not just science, but open and transparent science. Maybe by then, decentralization might be the antidote of polarization that we're having right now. Well, that's really true. But we have to be optimistic about what comes next. 
uh, or else we won't be making much progress, right? Well, she did. Theoretically, everything can be achieved, but I wonder about a few things. Since we are talking about science that it also includes technology, right? And also agile government, maybe what we want now is a younger, more innovative and more proactive leaders. We kind of need a group of leaders that are able to work together despite their national differences. And together they can form a firm regional resilience and preparedness towards any potential disaster. We need to see our preparedness and resilience as part of our livelihood matrix. What we can do is to leverage on technology advancement and that we have together and also share our experts. However, this can only be done with a functional government that are transparent and responsible enough. Yeah, uh, I think you are absolutely correct. We need to try to fit this uh, understanding into our current workflow. To achieve great things, it has to be start wrong, right? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Rome wasn't built in a day. Some of the possible questions that we need to ask our future self is that, can we live without national borders? Or better, can we become our own leader and no longer only depends on the government? We also need to ask ourselves if the younger generation are ready to lead and be included in the leadership now. However, throughout the process, we also need to pay attention to marginalized communities such as climate refugees. Where will they be in our future? And again, Sitich, while we are appreciating a future with technological advancement, we look forward to shape a new people dynamic with adaptive leadership, inclusive policy, and agile young governance. That's true. Anyway, Daniel, we have been wondering a lot so far. I need to take my lunch now. Oh yeah, I'm so sorry. I just had a word diarrhea. And uh, have you got your vaccine? Yeah, I've completed mine in May. Great, traveling is coming soon. I also recently took the vaccine. Well, I hope to meet you in person soon. Yeah, I also hope to. Enjoy bye your bye. lunch. Stay safe and healthy over there, okay? Sure. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Sid and Daniel. Very wonderful presentations. Uh, now we move to the next team. We have the green team now. Uh, with Ms. Lisa and Mr. Sankri. Thank you. Sakde, can you please share our presentation? Yes, yes. Wait a minute, please. Okay. Sure. So can you see? Yes, okay. but I think you should um, put it in the presentation mode, please. Yes, yes, yes. I'm gonna now let me. This one. There you go. Okay, so while Satek is figuring out how to put this in presentation mode, let me start. Um, Green Team wishes everyone a safe and healthy day. I'm Liza Ramos from Makati, Philippines, and also representing You Inspire Philippines. And of course, I'm with Satbek Sarshanov from You Inspire Central Asia. We'll be taking you to Green Team's future. Please join our journey and let's start time traveling. 2045, here we go. Next slide, please. There you go. Green Team's probable future is um, primarily envisioned with the rise of information and communications technology, such as use of artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and disaster prediction and detection systems, along with the state-of-the-art, never-before-seen mobility, transportation, and other smart city solutions. Technology connects with people and nature. We can see this future with high private sector and community engagement. A number of disaster risk production and disaster risk management policies are put in place and implemented well that the 2045 world we're living in espouses a resilient and risk-informed society. People would want to live in areas with better ecological conditions, that rural areas will be gentrified and developed with full of cultural landscape, landscapes, while urban areas will have more greeneries. Cross-collaboration is the name of the game in 2045. 
Maybe there will be no more conflict between countries and more institutions will invest on extensive and collaborative DRR and DRM researches, such as in the field of fusion energy, among others. It is also envisioned that, this, that the disasters we know now are not anymore how disasters would be defined then. Or a much better vision is that there's no more disaster to talk about as resilience has become part of our daily lives. Looking at our futures triangle, you will see that there are several factors that could pull us away from this probable future or what we call as the weight of the past, such as sociocultural and sociopolitical factors. For one, Political climate, particularly in terms of policy making, is believed to lack multi-stakeholder consultation and personal biases of policy, ma policy makers or loud lobbyists usually are dominating. Generally speaking, corruption has also become a systemic challenge for many of our countries. This is not to mention that our society usually works in silo. Social inequality is also rampant and cultural perception of climate and disaster risks varies. Moreover, many countries are still investing on disaster response rather than prevention and mitigation, and government is still the primary go-to institution for addressing disaster threats. But on the other side of the triangle, or the brighter side, we can also name several factors that could drive us towards our probable future, or what we call as push of the present. Because of the various disruptions and disasters we are experiencing, like, of course, the very famous COVID-19, earthquakes here and there, volcanic eruptions, floodings, even global warning and food insecurity, among others, we can see and feel increased consciousness of our stakeholders that sooner we can expect louder calls for more aggressive action and accountability from our quote-unquote leaders and policymakers. We can start seeing packets of effectiveness showcasing the power of community where people from different socioeconomic backgrounds are now more proactive in providing solutions. The private sector is also contributing to this. There are more public-private partnership initiatives and research collaborations happening in different parts of the world, not to mention private sector's aggressiveness in investing on ICT solutions. This multi-stakeholder engagement that we now see is a promising scenario of the future where government will not anymore be the primary source of help. Next slide, please. So you see, um, 2045 is a year of positivity for a green team. But of course, mind you, before our team reached a clearer vision of a probable future, there was a good balance of positives and negatives on how we individually foresee it. At the start, some of us um, see that disasters will get more and more complex. There will be extreme temperature, energy crisis, and resources will become lesser. But there are some seeing a flood-free future with nature-based solutions in place. Our individual biases and experiences um, surfaced. But as we go along, we found ourselves building on each other's ideas and we started coming up with a more cohesive future. And here on the slide, you can see some visuals of our desirable future, which are heavily on the side of ICT, artificial intelligence, and smart technologies. But overall, um, Green Team's desirable future is to have an inclusive disaster risk governance involving interdisciplinary and international actors where a resilient community leverages on technology while ensuring its balance and harmony with ecological and human well-being. Just imagine a world where nature, people, and technology complement each other. We really, I think at that time, we could not help but seeing what a wonderful world, isn't it? Our desirable future also sees distributed accountabilities among stakeholders with less bureaucratic and more collaborative governance where the concept of leadership will not only be defined as those in position, but more on those with capacity and legitimacy, earning other people's trust, confidence, and respect. Simply put, it's a world where everyone with the right competency and morality can be leaders and community is empowered. It's like the Murmuration Intensive Society or MIS where reach is limitless and everybody follows everyone in harmony. Now to discuss more on MIS, our reframing process and to continue sharing with you Green Team's story, here's Satbeck.
Sat back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliza, for this beautiful introduction. So, uh, in continue in reframing process, our team uh, work in framing process of disaster risk governments. We look closely on into leadership frameworks and perspectives of emerging leaders among youth and young professionals playing a big role in setting new frameworks and logic systems for future literacy disaster risk reduction. And also, they, uh, in, it, in the terms of memoration intensive society, it's evident that the dis we see disruption playing a big role in MIS, and we don't see uh, a need to stick by legacy systems and boundaries set up globally. We looked at leadership from bottom-up uh, perspective and have more agile structure in mind, even the types of leadership chosen uh, to spread governance. Also, in in conclusion, I would say that. Um, our team conclusion for disaster relief governments in 2045, we see leaders uh, who are emerging as they build systems and processes uh, around social perception detectors. They aren't elected individuals, nor are they made, but uh, it's meritocracy, and we see borders in collaborative arcs dissolved and nomadic ever changing design system in place. This is what our was. Uh, this is uh, our framing process that was related to disaster governments. And here are some assumptions uh, that we have before the future that we constructed. These assumptions, for example, that the disaster risk reduction is the responsible responsibility of government. That there's social inequality exists in disaster risk management, and uh, like there's a predominant focus on disaster relief rather than mitigation. What changed though? We just we understand that, for example, rising attention to sustainable development and environmental impacts will have major influence in 2045 disaster risk governments. And also what is uh, interesting, the technology uh, advancements that support disaster risk management will also contribute um, uh, to the disaster risk government operation. It's going to be as we probably expect expecting. It's like uh, artificial intelligence rescue groups uh, for any disaster events or machine learning for mitigation, drones, flying cars, etc. And also, uh, this whole uh, like idea of 2035 uh, that we image uh, inspires to achieve that there is going to be or that we have to move to the idea of self-government disaster risk management in the future. And, but still, after even reframing this um, whole process, we have some questions like how government, how government will work in gov uh, dominance of technology, potential change of leadership, how inclusive disaster risk governance will be, will the uh, like social aspects like corruption will exist, or what's the role of you, how much influence they have, and where this come from and is government will be if the government will be in charge of DRG still with what form so it's because very interesting and uncertain but we still can have probably some ideas about it and in the end we have a very interesting like reflection about all this series on activities that we have during three days uh, as as my teammates uh, think that the future literacy is about widening our horizons in terms of imagining our future and understanding challenges. In some way, the just, um, deconstructing norms can be one of uh, the solutions. Future thinking give us a platform to not be bounded by our biases and norms and be open to a new world. And one of my teammates uh, had a question during the session that how do we prepare for uh, something that we don't know. And during some of the visual activities, she came to idea or understanding that we should welcome disruptive thinking into our legacy systems to challenge and explore more uh, resilience in the emergency. And there's the fact that uh, probability that we always talking about uh, in future literacy and future desire futures um, is not that give us advantage, but the scenarios of future disasters that we created in our minds May let, uh, may let us help or prepare for them. So one of, as we can conclude that future literacy can connect our imagined 
future within a mind. Uh, with this imagination, we can anticipate well, within a mind about what can happen in the future. So we can analyze the factors that have influenced the future, that we imagine also what kind of actors that involve to shape the future. So thank you so much. This is the conclusion of our team about future literacy series. Thank you very much. Well done, Grimpy. So uh, we let we move to the next team. Uh, the last but not least, we have the WhatsApp team. Uh, we have Ms. Krupa and Ms. Tinitis. Thank you, Nuru, and thank you to all the presenters for the amazing and interesting presentations. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Rupa. I'm from India, and today, Tintis and I from Tintis from Indonesia, and I will be presenting on behalf of our Purple team. Giving you a brief introduction of our team, apart from us two, we have Carol from Philippines, Dika from Indonesia, and Alif from Maldives in our team, who are also present here as participants. We have fantastic facilitators, Rama and Sofia, who have helped us throughout the whole process. Anna, Nitika, and Zarina were our observers and note takers. Next slide, please. Ah, great. So we had an exciting discussion. And in our probable futures for disaster risk governance in 2045, we emphasize more on the collaboration of all stakeholders who are essential for a successful disaster risk governance. For example, civil societies, communities, youth, government in general, academia, experts, among others, in a heterarchical manner. Our future disaster risk governance is working towards finding collective solutions for communities during various disaster events through science-based policies and management plans. One of the important features of our future disaster risk governance is to make communities resilient by taking initiatives to build their capacities simultaneously living in harmony with nature and rest. Overall, the team shared similar ideas and perspectives on our probable future, and we reached these conclusions unanimously based on our understandings of the future triangle shown here. For us, the major pool of the future was the need of being a global citizen, flexible policies and management plans, the importance of DRR unifying all generations, People are living in harmony. The societies are open-minded and accepting, which means there is no discrimination of any sort. They are inclusive efforts, the inclusion of youth in decision-making, among others. The major push of the present were asynchronous policies, mostly response-based efforts, increasing awareness, climate change, and the need for compassionate societies. And for the past, we realized that a lack of vision in planning, lack of good governance, discrimination, and the economic disparity were the major weights, among others. Next slide, please. Yeah. In our desirable future, we have an efficacious disaster risk governance in place that includes a flourished cross sectoral collaboration, science and research based policies. There is a culture of prevention along with the response, and the youth is involved in the main disaster risk governance. The infrastructure is resilient to disasters and also promotes, promotes nature-based solutions. There are advanced technologies in our desirable future for early warning systems and predictions. And we have a functioning risk science communication system in place. In terms of the process, we started with imagining ourselves in the morning of 2045 and watching news headlines about the disaster event that occurred recently and how our ideal disaster risk governance had successfully faced the situation without any loss of life and the infrastructure to some extent. We identified the major actors of the future risk governance and their roles. During the process, we realized that as our team members are from different backgrounds, each member has her or his opinion for our desirable futures. For example, we all agreed on the importance of collaborations, multi-stakeholder co cooperation, and inclusivity, whereas some were more focused on response, while others were more focused on early warning system and governance, respectively, which fueled an interesting discussion on the topic. This is our reframing iceberg. Here you can see our headlines of the future, the actors involved in disaster risk governance, functioning systems, and related myths. As I mentioned earlier, 
We imagine waking up in our 2045 future with the headlines about how the disaster risk governance has been successfully managing a disaster event. People already know where to go, what to do, as they have been trained already via various training programs and learning initiatives. The government is mad, like it's making a difference. There are different actors involved, for example, communities, government authorities, experts, academia, youth, in short, everyone is inclusive. Different systems are working in synchronicity, as we do have some motivational myths, for example, which translates to strength through unity and do not break the chain, etc. Great. While reframing our future of disaster risk governance and referencing the nomination intents of society, which, are, which has already been explained by my uh, previous uh, co team yeah, teammates, uh, other teams, we envisage our future with an optimistic outlook, just like murmuration phenomena in real. Our overall frame, framed future of 2045 can be summarized in the form of a poem, which is written here, and as the poem, uh, and these pictures. And as the poem says here, the government is mad. It's making a difference, involving everyone in decision-making, developing learning programs for community to sustainably live in a harmon harmonious way by playing an orchestra of the wind blow jazz for us, from us, and by us. And we have used jazz orchestra as a metaphor for relaxation. In future, we are all relaxed because our disaster risk governance is working efficiently and we are all completely prepared to it. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to Tinnitus, who will take over the next part of the presentation. Over to you, Tinnitus. Thank you. Thank you, Rupa, for opening and begin the presentation of our team. Um, the next question about what are the underlying assumptions? The underlying assumption from this discussion was about the new concept of collaboration. Everyone can make a difference and give their influence to sustainable living. There is also found harmonious interaction among humans, technology, and natural balance. Decision making is well represented by the different stakeholders inside the community. That everyone will be heard inclusively and no one will be left behind. Second, what is new, the same, or changed? The actors will be the same, like government, academia, NGOs, indigenous people, etc. Because the character or roles or the partition of responsibility might still be the same, but the power is not always centralized or hierarchical. The localization of disaster management would, would be the change. As a bottom-up approach to recognize indigenous knowledge and the collective consciousness that is shaped by basic experience or from early age education or lifelong curiosity shapes the ability to have an autonomous response to cope with disaster or saving lives. And as a result, the distribution of power will be extremely new. It will keep changing and inclusive by adapting a, to a variety of problems or issues that we have to conquer. Lastly, the architecture design has many elements that are included in one picture, rooms, windows, water, garden, electricity channels, etc. We will see 2045 as a multidimensional picture of what we are creating together. Sometimes we have to focus on the wall, but we won't forget the window on it, and we want to nothing left, left behind. The foundation or basic element that we create is the collective consciousness. The metaphor is also explains that when new global agenda related to disaster risk governance is made, it all came from our collective restlessness or consciousness. So what kind of building and how we can work for it or make it come true together depends on us now. Um, and we left the workshops with the unanswered new questions that arose in our team, such as how to maintain long-term vision, how to distribute the power at the right time, how inclusive is inclusivity, how to achieve an integrated approach to governance, and how will be the uncertainty from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And then, next slide. Uh, next slide. We just paint, paint brass, and the colors that it creates, it describes the future is um, always there. But the, the question is how it will look like. 
we can do something to shape or color the future we, that we are dreaming of. We are the artists of all our own painting. It may be messy at first, but we will surely create a masterpiece. Challenges as all, uh, are always there, yet we, uh, if we persist in our perseverance, we can move forward to the inclusive, progressive, resilient, and peaceful future. And everyone has different principles or ideals of what the disaster risk governance looks, looks like. In other words, uniformity is extremely difficult to achieve. However, we, have, we all have the silver lining to define the end goal, which is to involve everyone of, or uh, leaving no one behind in the discussion or development or implementation and actions, as well as the seamlessly or smooth and continuous or uh, lifelong collaborate with each other to achieve zero casualties. And for the last, overall, I am personally happy and excited to experience this lab. And that was our presentation for Paul Kim. Thank you so much for having us here. Over to moderator. Thank you. Thank you, the purple team. It is very interesting to hear the different uh, collective ideas of the disaster risk governance in 2005. We thank you to all the presenters from the five teams and also to the members of each team for their hard work during the Future Literacy Laboratory on the RR and in the preparing presentations. Before we proceed to the next sessions, I would like to remind the participants if you have questions of the team presentation, please put in the QA box and the presenting team will answer the questions in the QA box. Now let's us return to the 2021 and I hand the moderation to Ms. Aisha Matuti. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nurul. Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Nurul. I am Aisha Marzuki. I'm from UNDP Accelerator Labs, and I will be the moderator of the session. So we have traveled to 2045, listened to the presentation of the five teams, and now we are back in 2021. We have two speakers with us, and I would like to welcome both Ms. Arati Krishnan, the Strategy and Foresight Advisor for UNDP, and Mr. Omar Ama, External Relations Officer from UNDRR. Ms. Arati and uh, Mr. Omar, if you can um, turn on your video and uh, mic, that would be amazing. Uh, yes, so thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, let me start uh, just quickly before we start. I would like to remind all the participants, if you have any questions for the speakers, please post in the Q&A box and the speakers will answer the questions um, if the time permits. So let me start with this question for both uh, Ms. Arati and Mr. Omar. We have heard the presentation of the five teams on their thoughts and processes on the features of disaster risk governance. So the whole point of today's discussion is regarding this topic, uh, exploring different future with its own limitations and benefits. And now we want to hear from both of you uh, on your views on this, uh, from both futures thinking and also the aspect of disaster risk reduction perspective. Let us start with Ms. Arati and then followed by Mr. Omar's uh, response. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha, and congratulations to all the participants uh, for your wonderful presentations. I thought that the presentations were incredibly interesting. There were some very common threads around inclusion and decentralization through all the presentations that came out that speak to the underlying desire of the participants uh, to, see, to see much more decentralized decision making. I think what's interesting about all of that is how will that actually influence action? In, in, in the future. Um, we And I think what that might speak to as well is particularly over the last year and a half, we've seen so much where governments around the world have not been able to meet uh, the needs of many, many parts of their society because many groups have been missed. And as a result, lots of mutual aid groups and community volunteer groups have popped up in many different countries to, to bridge the gap. So it's an interesting response to what has come up. And I think certainly the element on having much more inclu inclusive societies, more um, um, influenced strongly by AI is it speaks to speaks to where we are now, right? So it speaks to this idea that inequality is definitely increasing 
We see that every day. So how do we design futures differently? But overall, I thought the uh, presentations were really, really well done. Um, congratulations. And and I particularly loved the last one to, uh, that, that, that wound poetry into it. Congratulations. Amazing. Thank you, Arati. So Mr. Omar, now over to you. What are your thoughts about the reflections of these participants as well as on the topic of features of disaster risk governance in 2045? Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity and thank you to all these speakers who presented um, their presentations. My first reflection, uh, if I may, actually is about the intro video that was played at the beginning of the webinar. I noticed it said uh, natural and man-made disasters. And if we all remember back to the webinar we had on reflections on the past and future of DRR, Dr. Rajiv Shah mentioned that we're trying to banish the term natural disasters because disasters are not natural. They are the products of decisions that humans make. And so with that understanding, you know, that is what DRR is, is built on. You know, how do we improve decision making to uh, reduce the impact of disasters and even prevent them altogether? Um, I, I agree with them uh, uh, the, that the, the quality of the presentations was, was quite impressive. A lot of the issues and topics that were discussed are the issues that we're now dealing with in terms of how do we improve disaster risk governance in the region and in the world. So they've uh, hit the nail on many of the issues that you know we're currently discussing even at the uh, uh, most senior policy levels. I'm going to touch briefly on um, uh, three of them. First is uh, uh, collaboration and inclusion. So obviously this is uh, at the core of strengthening disaster risk governance because governance is a process. What it means is that when you are making decisions, you're including all the right people on the table. And that means the scientific community, the private sector, which is actually responsible for a lot of the actual construction and physical changes in the environment around us, the farmers, the, the residents of the cities and the villages that are being impacted. So that including them and making sure that there's this collaborative uh, process is, is key to preventing disasters, ensuring better outcomes. So we definitely agree with that. And we think this is something that needs to be strengthened moving forward. Another aspect is because this is really important to um, having what we call a uh, multi-hazard approach to disaster reduction. So what we mean by that is that usually um, people are focused on one particular type of disaster, floods because they're you know, frequent in a certain region um, or earthquakes because that country experienced an earthquake in the past. But I think what we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is that sometimes hazard can be a bit unexpected. So it's not what people were planning for. And yet, you know, this one virus has taken over the entire world. Uh, we've entered into this global pandemic. And really, if, 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 if there were better planning at the beginning where disaster risk management uh, officials were talking to healthcare uh, professionals and scientists, maybe we could have done more to uh, prevent this and, or, or, or reduce this impact um, at a much earlier stage. So this is why it's really important to have different people in the decision-making process. Uh, the second element I want to touch on was the issue of decentralization. So I really understand it more as localization rather than decentralization. And I think the difference has to do with um, some experiences that we've seen here in the region and elsewhere. So in one particular country, the national government decentralized decision-making to the local level and gave them full authority in terms of how they run uh, their disaster uh, risk management program. But the problem is they didn't actually give them the money or the capacity to uh, implement those decisions or plans. So if, if, if you provide you know, the authority and you decentralize responsibility to the lowest level, but don't actually empower them to do something about it, then you're setting them up for failure. So that's why I think it's really more important that we think about localization in the sense that national, uh, local plans uh, take into consideration uh, uh, the unique um, hazards and, and risks that exist in that environment that may not be available elsewhere at the national level, and that the national uh, governments actually support uh, the local authorities then in implementing these measures. In fact, this, I think the debate right now is happening in Germany. If you saw some of the media coverage that happened after the um, uh, failures of the early warning system, the debate was whether this was a central government uh, 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 problem or is, was it the states 
that failed to uh, uh, act appropriately in response to the warnings. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, even if power is decentralized, we need to make sure that local authorities have the resources and capacity to actually make the decisions that uh, keep them safer. And then the last point I want to touch on was um, the issue of technology. So I think that's a very important issue, science and technology, because you can't make um, you know, good decisions without having it back, be backed by science and, and evidence. And so obviously technology is key to that. But you know, technology on its own is not gonna solve the problems of disasters because at the end of the day, again, it goes back to decision-making. I think you know, a lot of us have on our phones you know, this, this indicator that turns red every time we raise the volume too much if we have headphones on. And so that's warning us that if you go beyond this point, you might be damaging your ears. And yet how many of us actually go past that point? Because you know what, that song is just too good. And you know, if I damage my ears, it's gonna be something that I won't really feel the impact of which until you know, years from now. But that's really you know, uh, what it comes down to. You know, the technology can provide us with the knowledge, um, but then do we act on it? Do we make the right decisions based on that information? I think that is a critical factor for preventing disasters. But overall, I thought it was a great discussion and I thank everybody who, who put a lot of time and effort into uh, putting together these presentations. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Mr. Omar and Ms. Arati. I think some of the participants are already putting key messages that are very impactful in, in the chat. So thank you for sharing with them. Uh, now, thank you for both of your response. It's interesting to hear your reflections on the topic. Uh, let me continue with Ms. Arati. So Ms. Arati is specialized in strategic foresight for the humanitarian and development sector for the past 15 years globally, and now focusing on Asia and the Pacific uh, works around that. Given that the participants have come from across Asia in this particular Futures Literacy Labs, what are your reflections on potential benefits on incorporating features thinking in disaster risk production, particularly in Asia Pacific? What does it all mean moving forward? Uh, thanks, Aisha. Um, I'm really, I really resonated with a lot of the points uh, Omar raised, which speaks to the need to better understand what is emerging into the future, right? And that's, you know, the link between futures thinking and anticipatory action is very strong. I mean, we all know that money invested into preparedness in advance of a crisis or a disaster happening is 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 much better than the money that that ends up getting spent after during re response or during recovery. It's actually a lot cheaper. The point though is, and I think this is the point Omar was, was saying, and, and we know this also in the foresight space, is we can have as much knowledge in advance of a event happening, but it comes down to the decisions. Like, so let's talk about COVID, yeah? So COVID, you know, when COVID happened, um, people were talking about it like it was a black swan event, something completely unexpected. But that wasn't actually true. The idea of a global pandemic of this scale had actually been in trends, really. it's been talked about and written about for the last 10 years. What was different is the lack of decision-making around it because our decision makers did not think it was serious enough to be better prepared for it. So that's what we come to. So in terms of the link between futures thinking and disaster risk governance, it's, it's extremely, extremely close and it will ultimately come down to how do we understand how risks are changing not just now, but into the future. So how do we not keep drawing the common thread, assuming risks will look exactly the same? How do we look at the interconnectedness of different types of risks, whether it's strategic risks, whether it's climate-induced risks, etc.? And then how do we better understand how the needs and desires of people will change and evolve through that time? And the reason I say that is often we one of the one of the things I thought was missing in a lot of the assumptions was the needs and desires of people. Yeah, often we make assumptions about what people need and desire and what their profile is going to be like, and therefore we design our disaster uh, uh, response plans according to those assumptions. But the reality is, as risks change, so do people. People are not static. Our needs are not static. Static. Our profiles change. Who we are now in 2021 isn't who 
we're going to be in 2045. So how do we understand that better? I want to draw on a very quick example here. Um, many years ago, when the Greek migration crisis was happening, and everybody was flooding to Greece to, to set up um, response uh, uh, programs, um, receiving the programs, etc., for all the migrants arriving by sea, one of the things that came out from that very strongly was that the profile of the migrant was very, very different to what their programs were actually being able to deliver. So people assume when you are, you know, during a response, when you're the first, first three things people need when they arrive is food, water, shelter. And that wasn't actually true. What people were asking for was, you know, where's the Wi-Fi? How can I connect my phone so I can call the people that I've left behind to let them know where we are? So suddenly the profile wasn't this bereft um, person, but it was actually, you know, educated people that were fleeing circumstances beyond their control. And it really challenged the, the assumptions we had made in the humanitarian sector about what our responses were going to be. It, you know, it challenged this understanding that actually we need to make sure we have Wi-Fi and charging stations and partner accordingly so the services can be provided. And that's the point I want to make. The a, understanding the link between all the anticipatory models, all the futures thinking models into our decision making, and how do we design governance structures around that more appropriately? How do we ensure that we're not just assuming risks will look the same based on the, 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 um, the pull of what is happening now because risks are not static and how do we also understand how the needs desires of people will change and will look different into the future and therefore you know the types of programs we might design now based on that may not be what people will actually want or need and one of the things i often say in or think about in my work is if it was your child or grandchild fleeing or needing support and they needed to come to your organization and they needed to come to your uh to your community for to you know for aid would you feel safe sending your child or your grandchild to that organization and would they be taken care of would they be understood and would they be safe and those are the sort of the questions i think about when it comes to how do we ensure that our future risks uh, mechanisms are appropriate, are fair, are inclusive, um, not just for today, but for the futures as well. I'll stop there, Aisha. Thank you so much, Arati. I think that's a very powerful vision or um, boundaries to set when we're talking about, you know, our children and grandchildren in, the, in that very position. Uh, let's, let's now move to Mr. Omar. Uh, Mr. Omar, you're the External Relations Officer of UND, UNDRR Regional Office for Asia Pacific leading communications and resource mobilizations efforts throughout the region. Uh, you have touched upon this uh, briefly before, but we do see that from the presentations that there are emerging common themes, right? We, we are between the team, uh, between the themes such as um, decentralization, as you mentioned, should be viewed around localization and inclusivity. And we want to know what is your reflection on this um, regarding how to move forward, how to better adjust disaster risk governance in, say, Asia-Pacific regarding the common themes that we unravel through the process already? I mean, I really do think, that, and somebody touched on this in one of the presentations, the issue of um, um, accountability. So I think that needs to be built in uh, to these disaster risk management systems, and it needs to become a, a public demand. So, I mean, I think people are quite aware now that, you know, there are, you know, uh, youth-led protests around the world uh, demanding uh, action around climate change. I think we need that same type of momentum around disaster risk reduction so that policymakers, decision makers, business leaders who are making the decisions that impact our environments take into consideration the views of the youth, the people who are vulnerable to the impacts uh, of these changes, and include them in the decision-making process. And obviously youth are quite critical because you know, this is a, a cross-generational um, issue. The decisions we make now could impact you know, the environment you know, decades from now. And so they will be living with the consequences of those decisions. Amazing, thank you so much, Omar. And uh, we do think that in terms of what came up from the presentations is that all of the themes are, um, said that you know youth needs to be included in that decision making processes and what does it look like does it mean that you know young government would be the vision uh, in 2045 so thank you so much for emphasizing uh, on that note 
So uh, let me again proceed with you, Mr. Omar. Um, UNDR is organizing the global platform uh, on disaster risk reduction in 2022. Um, how do you perceive this Futures Literacy Labs uh, in DRR activities in relation to that uh, GPDRR 2022? What are the potential benefits uh, from these sort of activities that could elevate perhaps uh, the design around GPDRR? Um, and maybe what are your thoughts on potential topics that could be discussed in future events? Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, um, the uh, global platform will be taking place um, in uh, 2022 in Bali, Indonesia. And I think the discussion here and, you know, the discussion of, you know, the future of uh, DRR is essential to it because really um, the, 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 the goal of the uh, GP, as we call it, is to take stock of where we currently are and try and, and push forward to the year 2030, which is the year that the Sendai Framework of Disaster Risk Reduction is supposed to be implemented. So there isn't much discussion about what happens beyond that. And I think it's really important that we begin that discussion now about what does the world look like post-Sendai, you know, in, in the year 2045, uh, because, you know, these are, again, things that we need to start grappling with. And so I think having the publication that is gonna basically have the, the summary and the key findings of this uh, project uh, be published and released around the global platform is gonna be very important to in, informing the thinking of the you know, most senior experts and decision makers on DRR who are gonna be all gathered from around the world in Indonesia. And so exposing them to these ideas, I think will hopefully help them think not only you know, what do we do now, but the, what do we do uh, decades from now as well. Amazing. Oh, and one last question on, on the topic. So um, one recommendation I would have uh, in terms of future topics is development. So one uh, thing that we usually say within the DRR community is that disasters are the result of failed development. So we, we usually think about disasters impacting development, um, but also it works the other way around, where development that is not informed by risk consideration. So if you build something too quickly, in, or you know, too cheaply and in a hazard prone area, then you've basically you know, created the conditions for a disaster that may not happen you know, today or tomorrow, but will happen uh, some point down the line once the right conditions are there. And so I would say if you could look more about the issue of development and how can we ensure that the development decisions that we make now do not introduce new risks. Um, and this is basically related to anything that involves um, um, changes to the physical environment, agriculture, construction, and so on. I think that's very powerful. Thank you so much, Mr. Omar. It's usually it's it requires us to rethink, I guess, the the relationship between disasters and development. Whether you know we we need to stop blaming it for uh, because of uh, development, but now we think the other way around of anticipating how can we better support and plan for development to anticipate and mitigate future disasters. So thank you so much, Mr. Omar, for sharing your thoughts on the matter. And we are on the last uh, question. So let me close this session uh, by getting the thoughts of Ms. Arati uh, on this as well. We are we have seen that from different um, presentations from the teams today that there is quite a lot of interest to translate the learning on features thinking, say on disaster risk governance and other topic um, on envisioning different uh, probable futures, desirable reframe features on translating that into daily activities, incorporating that to decision-making, which are, we already discussed a lot today. What would your advice be for young professionals that want to inform and reflect on current decision-making based on the learnings they have uh, from features thinking? Thank you, Aisha. I think one of the most incredible thing about futures thinking um, when we're getting introduced to it um, is this idea and um, it's, the, it's the idea that it generates radical hope and radical hope, meaning this idea of what could possibly be in the future or the range of futures that, 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 that is ahead of us. And, and radical hope is a powerful thing. We often don't design for joy. We design, you know, the word resilience came out a lot for very obvious reasons. And I want to come back to that point. But, you know, what, what is the type of world we want to live in that is joyful, that is hopeful? Um, and then what does it mean for me today as a young young person. Now, often uh, young people, particularly in our region, 
we, you know, we get torn between this idea about whether we can influence, whether we can really influence the future. Are, are, are we, are we in the driving seat of our own futures, right? Or are we influenced by our religion, by familial uh, obligation? You know, is 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 our destiny already preordained, so to speak? And it's a push and pull that's very specific to our cultures in the region. You know, we sort of straddle multiple identities all the time, trying to fit into it. So I think one of the um, things that becomes really powerful through futures thinking, when we see the hope of, of, of what our destinies could be, or to mitigate the dystopias of, of what our destinies might be, is learning to straddle that with the types of identities and roles we play today. And what I mean by that is, how can then I, in my, in, in, in all the identities I wear, where I am, you know, um, have these different obligations and responsibilities to different groups of people actually keep that idea of the future, that radical hope firmly into my vision and make the types of decisions I need to make. I, I may not know what it looks like, but it helps me set the roadmap. And I think having that roadmap becomes really integral because one of the things we learn as young people in Asia and the Pacific is that, you know, we're not what people assume we are. We're not just predetermined and predestined to, to, to lead this type of life that people assume we're going to lead. And this is going to come to my point about uh, resilience. Um, you know, we in this region have faced multiple disasters and, and you know, we're known particularly in Asia for the numerous amount of uh, disasters that, that we experience. Um, you know, in Jakarta, you, you guys know this more than anybody else. You know, this, the, this resilience has always been the bedrock of, of development work, of humanitarian action work, you know, how do we build resilient societies, etc. But I want to put something out there that might be a little bit provocative. Since when did we accept that resilience was the thing that we wanted to achieve? Why are we not saying, and why are we not striving to flourish, to thrive, and what would that look like? And this work being done now, uh, one of my favorite uh, ac uh, academics, Malaka Shwek, she argues that the discourse of resilience is dehumanizing sometimes, because what it does is it produces or reproduces people that are most impacted by disasters, by events, by, ad, by, by adversarial issues to be extraordinary people who will endure all the suffering imposed on them. And that's actually a violent issue because it places the onus on individuals to be resilient on issues beyond our own control. So I want to encourage us to, to just think about that and shift that a little bit. What is the futures of resilience actually? You know, how do we move from just surviving to actually thriving? And how do we ensure, and the threads of this were coming out in a lot of the, a lot of the presentations, was that the onus isn't on us to, to be strong and survive no matter what happens, but actually bring, you know, hope, may ensure responsibility is placed at those, um, at, at those with power and with, and, and, um, have the decision-making power to make the right types of decisions. So again, this idea of radical hope of expanding our boundaries challenges us to go beyond, you know, what we think our preordained pre destinies might be. Uh, but it also challenge allows us to challenge notions that um, that that can be expanded and reimagined um, as we're also reimagining risk and reimagining governance systems. Um, I'll stop there. Amazing, very powerful um, key messages from both of you today. Uh, thank you so much. So we have heard from both Mr. Omar and Ms. Arati about the different complexity surrounding disaster risk reduction and what does it entail in terms of thinking differently about development that you know disaster is the cause perhaps of failed development than the other way around. We also seen that from today's discussion that disaster risk reduction should be taken or stretched towards the extent of you know, producing radical hope and to motivate us, uh, everyone here today to rethink, you know, are we actually in the driving seat um, of you know, determining our own future? So we've seen that the different aspects that were discussed today hopefully could motivate young professionals in Asia Pacific and beyond to 
take stance on what o Mr. Omar mentioned about, you know, um, youth-led demonstration to be more active and vocal in ensuring that our voice are shared, our voice are incorporated in future decision making. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Omar and Ms. Arati. Uh, we thank you both uh, for your views. Uh, this has been very helpful for us to prepare and proceed further with our future thinking in our activities. Um, I would like to remind participants, if you have any questions for the speakers, please post in the Q&A box and our speakers will try to answer the questions uh, if the time permits. So thank you, Mr. Omar and Ms. Arati. Now uh, we will proceed to the next question and answer session that will be more moderated by Ms. Saki Suzuki. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you everybody for staying with us until the end of this session. And thank you so much for all the speakers, presenters for sharing your views. To conclude this uh, webinar, I would like to invite Dr. Riel Miller head of Futures Literacy Laboratory to provide a few words and also comment on presentation and questions. Indeed. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear all this and, and, to, and to see it unfolding in, in its richness. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, deeply uh, impressed and, and honored to be, to be part of this. Um, I, I wanna pick up on, I think, some of the, the, the fantastic threads that, that have been uh, woven throughout the, the conversation um, and perhaps uh, enter into it through the point of what does it mean to be better prepared? Um, and then what does it mean uh, to, be, to be better at thinking about the future? Um, so I think that the, 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 the conversations we're engaged in today, we need to be aware of the fact that we're living at a time as always when the conditions are not the same as in the past and that we are uh, able to take advantage, but also have to deal with uh, certain disadvantages um, that, that give us a specific uh, challenge. And here I, I would draw attention to what I think is, is a, a transition that is taking place between goal-based perspectives on development and uh, how to relate to the world around us and capability-based approaches. Um, there, there's a fundamental difference between uh, making a bet and preparing for a specific goal uh, and taking a capability-based approach. And we know that the downsides, um, the, the, the you know, betting on a specific goal can lead to a big payoff if you bet on the right horse. But then uh, Arathi's example I thought was, was, was wonderful about the, the, the refugees in Greece where we were prepared, but we weren't prepared for what actually happened. And of course, that's something that takes place all the time. A capability-based approach uh, doesn't exclude the kind of thinking, learning, preparation um, that we're familiar with. And it doesn't exclude setting goals, but what it does is it, uh, opens us up to perhaps a more humble perspective on the future uh, and also invites us to be more sensitive to the emergent present and therefore also allows us to prepare better for precisely the, 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 what we know all the time, which is that when things arrive, they're not as expected. The surprise is inevitable. And if we're better prepared to be improvisational, meaning to not just stick to the plan or not just invest in planning, but invest in being able to not plan, to not uh, impose uh, an existing solution. This provides us with, with uh, a capability that makes it easier um, and more credible and more effective to be more humble, to be more open, to be less colonizing, uh, and also to enhance and, and, and kind of uh, exercise this tremendous ability that humans have to imagine. So as we go beyond imposing uh, the idea that we can impose today's ideas on tomorrow, we're actually changing the conditions of change. And it's this change that I think today, you know, which, and people will know from the Futures Literacy references, when a, a community becomes able to read and write in the classic reading and writing literacy sense, that changes the conditions of change. They become better able to do some things. Some of the things won't be good. Some of the things won't be bad, you know, will be bad. And some of the things, you know, will still be uh, overcome by surprises. But the point is, is that by focusing on a capability 
perspective. Um, we can enhance key aspects of our, of our so communities, our social organization. And when it comes to the future, there's a key part of this that has to do with diversification, being more agile, being more openly transitional. But I think crucially, uh, as Arathi also drew our attention to this question of, of radical hope, is to be able to uh, see ways in which finding meaning in life, being able to constantly learn and therefore find meaning in things that are happening around us all the time, to have the ability to appreciate constant difference and to be uh, comfortable, in fact, inspired by creativity uh, in the face of a creative universe. That's all uh, the, the, that I think we're currently trying to grapple with and it makes for a very inspiring context uh, for the work that we're doing together. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Riel, for your uh, very inspiring concluding message. Uh, we hope this Let's Talk DLL was uh, interesting for all of you and triggered your interest in our activities. Here are some final uh, announcements. We will have our next Futures Literacy Laboratory on disaster risk reduction in, from 6 to 8 October. So if you are interested to, to know more about our next um, activity, you could express your interest uh, by email. Please check the uh, chat box. And also attendance list, which was shared through the chat box, will be closed at uh, 6 p.m. in Jakarta time. Please make sure you feel before that. And thank you very much for your kind attention and hopefully you will join our next activities. Have a nice day and a great weekend. Stay safe and keep healthy. Bye-bye.